Welcome to a crash course in AI so that you can understand ChatGPT. My name is Minakshi Sharma. I'm the past president of Toronto Health Libraries Association, and I use the pronouns she, her. I know we have attendees from across Canada, and there's been a lot of interest in ChatGPT and AI recently. Whether you're new to this topic or have been learning about it already, I know you'll be engaged by our two guest speakers today. First, I'd like to acknowledge that the session is co-sponsored by the Canadian Health Libraries Association, Health Sciences Information Consortia, and the Toronto Health Library Association. I'd like to thank CHLA and HSIC for their support for today's book draw. Winners will be drawn randomly and contacted via email later this month. Even though we're meeting virtually, I'd like to acknowledge that these lands on which I live, work, and meet are the traditional territory of many nations, including the Wendat, Anishinaabe Nation, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. I also acknowledge all treaty people, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants either in this generation or in generations past. I've been a settler in various parts of Southern Ontario since 1989, and I'm grateful for the many opportunities and privileges that I've benefited from as I live, learn, work, and raise a family on these lands. I also recognize some inhabitants uh, came here involuntarily, particularly forcibly displaced Africans brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. In the spirit of peace, friendship and respect, I encourage each of you to reflect on your history, your journey and your relationship with this land and to understand the historical ties, the lived journey and the relationship Indigenous people, Inuit and Métis have with this land. Each of us can continue to make efforts towards learning, fostering respect, and ensuring reconciliation within our personal and professional lives. And finally, it's my pleasure today to introduce Amanda Wheatley and Sandy Ervu. Amanda Wheatley is an Outreach and Engagement Coordinator, Humanities and Social Sciences Library and a liaison librarian for management, business, and entrepreneurship at McGill University. Sandy Irvu is head librarian at Naham Gelber Law Library at McGill University. Welcome to Amanda and Sandy. Thank you, thank you both. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we also thought we would start by a, with a language acknowledgement to acknowledge where we're situated, so both uh, Amanda and I are in different libraries, but both on the McGill campus. Um, and McGill University is located on land, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous people, um, including the Audinashane and Anishinaabe nations. Um, and McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of these lands and waters on which we meet today. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to do um, a little AI background just to get you comfortable with some of the terms that we're going to use when we start talking about chat GPT. Um, and then we'll actually delve a little bit more into that topic. We'll talk about chat GPT um, and large language models because that's a big component of what chat GPT is. Um, and then some interesting um, use cases. For example, um, we've seen interesting uses in systematic reviews which could be of interest um, to all of you. So if we move to the next slide. So we'll start with our, a little bit of an AI background. Um, bear with me, there's a few definitions in the next slides, but we'll try to make it um, as interesting as possible. Um, so if you've engaged with artificial intelligence in any way, um, even on the news or you know any kind of reading, you'll probably start to notice that there's a lot of different definitions, right? Um, so we came up kind of with our own, which is based on a few different ones that we've that we've encountered. But mostly, we define it as something that can be explained as the development of machines to accomplish tasks and also reproduce top processes that are normally seen in humans, um, which is a main component. Um, and that this simulation of intelligent behavior is unique from other automations as it requires the computer to use human reasoning 
or thinking to perform tasks, right? As opposed to something that we would automate ourselves and kind of control, um, this one is kind of responsible for higher thought processes. So if we move to the next slide. Okay. So when we talk about AI, you'll probably encounter a lot of different terms, and sometimes people use them kind of interchangeably, right? So it becomes a little confusing as to, you know, what people actually mean. Are they the same thing? Are they, you know, subsets? So we can think of AI as this kind of giant umbrella, and we'll show you a wonderful chart that Amanda's created in a little bit. Um, so you can think of AI as kind of like the parent, uh, the big umbrella, and there's a lot of different subsets within that. So as is the case with machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of AI, um, and it's used to kind of teach computers how to learn and act without being explicitly programmed. So you're going to give it some algorithms, some training data to learn to, to build something. So it involves the construction of algorithms um, to adapt their models to improve um, the ability to make predictions. So you're going to feed it this data, these algorithms, so that it can predict um, outcomes, essentially. Um, and as an, Amanda mentioned, please put any question or comments in the chat. Um, so machine learning is one thing and is a term you will hear, hear very frequently. So if we move to the next one, we'll have a look at deep learning, which is further subset of machine learning, goes a little bit more in depth, um, and the approach aims to avoid the need for human operators um, to kind of specify all the knowledge that a computer needs. So you wouldn't need like a human there all the time to specify what um, that computer needs. Um, and it uses a hierarchy of concepts that enables a computer to learn complicated concepts by building them out of simpler ones. So already we can see that's kind of a level a little bit more in depth than machine learning. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we should start talking about generative AI, which is something you've probably heard people mention when they talk about chat GPT, right? So chat GPT is an example of what we call generative AI, um, which is a subset of machine learning, right? Because it uses algorithms and it attempts to predict answers, which is actually what um, chat GPT does and what Amanda's going to tell us a little bit more about, um, but it uses a huge training um, training set. So of data, in this case, I think it's 45 terabytes of data. So it's quite massive. Um, and the goal of those generative AI is always to generate new content, right? Whether it be text, um, some of them create images, music, some of you may have heard about the fake um, Drake The Weeknd song that ended up on streaming platforms. That's an example of generative AI. It can do art. It's essentially building something new out of existing um, kind of data that it's building on. Um, and it's it requires a lot of resources to build, right? A lot of financial resources, a lot of data, as you can see, right? 30, 45 terabytes, technical people, um, something that's not always talked about too is the environmental impact that some of these models have, right? If we need a lot of server farms and data and, and people, um, that does put a kind of environmental strain on things. Um, so that's essentially what Chad GPT is. Um, it's a type of generative AI, but in this case, it's going to produce text. Um, so if we go to our next slide. Um, so this is kind of the, the chart I was telling you about that shows the umbrella um, and all the different categories and subsets of AI. So we can see artificial intelligence, we can see machine learning, um, our deep learning. Um, we also have some natural language processing in there, which is something that Chad GPT uses, right? Because it's gonna kind of parse the language that people put in before giving um, an answer. So this can be helpful to kind of help you understand um, where it sits within the framework of AI. Uh, but like I mentioned, sometimes AI, you know, it can be the big umbrella. Um, and sometimes people will use it to talk about um, some of these subsets. So sometimes people will say AI instead of saying natural language processing, or they'll say AI when they mean machine learning, right? So sometimes it can get, you know, they can be used as kind of a, a larger concept to describe a lot of different things. Okay. 
So if we move on to our next slide, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about chat GPT and some of those large language models. Um, so like I mentioned, chat GPT uses a large language model to kind of function. So large language models are massive. Like we saw the 45 terabytes of data. Um, so it's massive amounts of training data that are used to um, teach an algorithm um, without the explicit instruction of a human, right? A, a human isn't behind the screen telling it, respond this. It's using all the data that it learned from that large language model to predict an answer without a person being involved, right? Apart from the person asking the question, obviously. Um, relationships. So it's also built, it's also used to build context and relationships between some of the words and phrases that make AI capable of predicting and responding to prompts, right? As opposed to asking it one question that doesn't require context um, or any kind of kind of un understanding of what the person is saying, um, the large language model helps build that context. So if you're asking it a question like, um, can you write me a summary of this book? It will give you an answer. And then you can say, oh, can you write me a summary of this book in this style? It will still pick up from the context what you're asking it to do. Um, and they're quite powerful. Um, so the GPT, um, the one that's used to train chat GPT 3.5 and 4 um, is quite a powerful large language model. Um, and it's also the most commonly used one. Um, in the world at this moment, that could change. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, so what's actually ChatGPT? So I may have entered a little bit of that, but um, it's actually a large language model tool. So it uses this GPT um, training set and it uses artificial intelligence, specifically natural language processing, right? To parse out and understand what people are asking. Um, to answer user-generated prompts, right? So if, you, if you've used it in asking questions, you can see that it can respond to your prompts and the answer will vary on the prompt you're asking it, right? Um, and it was developed by OpenAI using GPT 3.4 and GPT 5. Um, and it's currently available for public use, although I believe GPT 4 requires like an account for it, um, like a paying account, but anyone can try it anytime. Um, it's also, quite popular, so there may be times when you try to use it that you can't because it's at capacity. So just be aware that that may be um, the case. And I will turn it over to Amanda, I think, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about what it can and can't do. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Um... Actually, before actually, if we can go back to the other slide, um, this is something that Sandy and I were recently working on with another work. And it, as I was looking at the GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, I was thinking about this, the open letter um, from researchers to actually halt experimentation with GPT 4. Um, and what's actually really interesting here is uh, GPT 3 um actually had a very similar halt on it when this came out i remember when um there was a lot of articles that came out written by the gpt3 transformer back in 2019 and everybody freaked out because they were like uh journalism articles that were so realistic they were so hyper realistic that um people could not tell the difference between those and those written by the ai and those written by humans and then there's this huge freak out we had to halt on this and then 3.5 came out and they were using that to develop chat GPT. GPT, and now four is causing this huge kind of chaotic storm. And so um, Sandy and I, uh, for, for another project, had looked at the, this open letter by researchers to, to just kind of halt experimentation, to kind of stop and look at what are we creating with these going forward? What does that mean for the world? What are the ethical ramifications? Um, so I thought that was, that was really interesting that Sandy had found that letter. Okay, so now we can go to the next slide. Uh, so what can chat GPT do? Uh, so fairly basically, it can respond to text questions, it can have a back and forth dialogue, and it can create content. Uh, now that is at the base of, of what this tool does. Um, 
You'll think if you've ever used a chat bot before in your life, you've had that kind of back and forth dialogue, but you always kind of got the sense that you were talking with the computer, um, that there was something slightly off about this. And while there is still a little bit of that experience with uh, the chat GPT interface, it is definitely a lot more realistic. It's come a long way than, than early chat bots that uh, used to be out there on the internet. I remember as a, as a kid in my computer class is probably dating me quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> But I remember we would go on to those during computer class and we would like work with a learner bot 3000 and we'd be asking it questions and are you a robot? Prove to me you're not a robot. And the answers are just always so obvious. Uh, whereas now they're they're a lot more difficult to parse through, which is kind of interesting. Um, we can go to the, the next slide here. So what can't ChatGPT do? And I think this is where um, things start to get really, really interesting. So the first thing to understand is that ChatGPT is not a search engine. Uh, it is not connected to the internet, at least on the free basic version that anybody can create an account and sign up for. Um, if you do want to use ChatGPT4 and pay for a subscription, there are opportunities to connect it to a live search. There are also APIs that you can use and web browser extensions that you can use with the free public version that would allow you to bring in web searching. So there's ways around that, but the actual tool itself is not a search engine. It's not designed for you to go in the way that you would with Google and be able to pull out uh, information and get links to websites. Um, and this is kind of current events is really uh, another area where we kind of we draw the line. So that data set that Sandy was mentioning within the large language model, all of that textual information, all of the data points that were put into the large language model are what this tool was trained off of, which means that it only knows up until that data. And chat GP, or sorry, uh, GPT 3.5, uh, the, the public version, was only trained on content up until the year 2021 which means that anything after 2021 is not accessible. And so, for instance, as a business librarian, I could go in there and type in, you know, what was the last price for the Nike stock on this date in 2021? And it could theoretically tell me if it has that information. Um, but it couldn't tell me for 2022. Um, it couldn't tell me for 2023. And again, it might not even be the correct answer, which is something we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but the other thing that we'll find is that when we do Google searches, when we ask for information, we also get non-textual responses. We get images. Sometimes we get uh, video links at the top through our linked data. Uh, we're getting different types of search results. Um, ChatGPT, as it currently stands, cannot create images or videos. Again, there are APIs and web extensions, people who are trying to augment this aspect. So you will see some of that out there in the conversation. But the actual tool itself that you're working with does not create images for you. There are um, really interesting AI tools like Dolly and Midjourney that can create image content. Um, Sandy mentioned the Drake and Weekend uh, song. So there are a lot of very interesting ones that can create audio for you. Um, but this specific tool only does text. Um, and I saw actually someone mention, I think someone saw at the very beginning of the chat when I joined in something about the fake citations as being an issue. So that's the other thing that Ch chat GPT can't do. It can't provide citations because it's not actively connected to the internet. It's not referring back to a website. Um, it's not going to include those. But the other thing is that, it, like I said, it's not a search engine where it's trying to find you a kind of one-to-one -one answer. Um, it is building an answer based off of predictive analytics and predictive text. So think about that relationship that Sandy was mentioning. It's looking for the relationships between the words. And so it's trying to tell you the best answer based on the best combination of words related to your search, which means you'll get journals that are real because those are those are the names of journals. It knows those. You'll get articles that sound like they could be real. They might be real authors. They might be a real title from a different journal, from a different author, three different things all put together um, because it's thinking that these should be real responses to your question. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they are. And so uh, oftentimes these are referred to as hallucinations. Of course, on the library end, we would just call these fake citations or fake news for the chat GPT, you know. Um, but if you're looking more from the computer science side of the conversation, hallucinations is the terminology that you're going to see 
most often. And ChatGPT is upfront about this as well. Um, if you go into their frequently asked questions, they do know that this is an issue and they've been trying to fix it with ChatGPT4, which is why you do get some of that live connection to the internet uh, to go back to sources. Um, but what's really funny is there's been people who've been trying to do that with the live connection and the link that it sends them to is actually just like a broken page. It's a 404 error. It doesn't exist. So it's creating random links to websites that don't exist. And it's creating made up content when it's not supposed to. So um, this is, yeah, this is, this is an issue. But from the perspective of chat GPT as well, it might also be a fail safe. Uh, and this is something that they mentioned in their FAQ as well, that maybe some of the hallucinations are intentional. It's not necessarily designed to be a search engine, remember. Um, it is designed to do predictive text and predictive analytics, which means that this is a very uh, clear way for us to know if this is something real or something not. We can do the work. We can uh, you know, <laughs> put on our librarian hats and investigate. Um, although I do know colleagues who spent about an hour on chat with students uh, before they realized that these citations were fake because they weren't told they were coming from chat GPT. So there's that side of things as well. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide here. So um, this is just really quickly, uh, I know a lot of libraries are putting these out. And so actually, if you have links to your own guides, we would really love to see them. Um, this is one that we've created for our institution that kind of does a lot of uh, what the past uh, slides have been to kind of summarize what is ChatGPT, what are its limitations, uh, what are some of the privacy issues around using ChatGPT. And then we also have some interesting articles and browser extensions and things like that that we think our community might be interested in. Um, but please, if you do have any of this material that you've created that you would like to share, um, and you have a link you want to put in the chat, we would love to see what everybody's working on, or if you've come across one that you think is really great. Um, this is just the one that we've been building for our community, but we do love to see other people um, creating resources well and everybody sharing their content. I feel like it it makes us all feel like we're we're working on this together. We're getting through this together. Um, so we can go ahead and move into uh, kind of more of a uh, subject specific discussion here. Um, and so we chose kind of the topic of systematic reviews specifically for this audience, because we thought uh, this might be an audience uh, who, who is more predisposed to that, that conversation. Um, so uh, this has come out with uh, a couple librarians at our institution. We've kind of talked about this, and uh, I know librarians also are having these conversations as well, and, and researchers are having these conversations. How might ChatGPT be used in a systematic review process? And I think there's going to be a lot of larger conversations about the direction that academia goes in with, with these resources, but for the most part, there's not a lot of guidance yet. And so uh, if we go to the next slide, there's three kind of areas that Sandy and I have kind of pinpointed as being really useful, uh, a really a kind of best use cases for ChatGPT. Uh, one is generating search strings. The second is recommending databases. And then the third is research ideation. So if we go to the first slide, and I've put screenshots in here, um, but if we do want to do some live testing, we can do that as well. We can flip over and I can share my screen for a bit. Um, but this is just an example of a basic conversation. Um, I had taken this search string. So I'm the AM uh, in the chat there. And uh, I said, I'm doing a systematic review and I need a search string for the following terms. Um, I won't do our health community the disservice of trying to pronounce all of those words. Uh, but essentially, I went into an existing published systematic review. I took their search methodology. I copy pasted the list of search terms that they put in their article and I put it into chat GPT. Because the other thing that I noticed about the, the systematic review that I was reading was that they didn't actually publish their search string, just this list of words. Um, so I wanted to see what it could recommend for me. And um, so you see we've got a, a kind of basic search that comes in here um, with, with my Boolean operators. And what we don't see in there, and actually maybe I'll just take a, a quick screenshot of this. Actually, you know what, um, do, you, do you mind if we do um, switch screen sharing? Because I think it'd be really cool to show how the conversation played out. And I've just made you the host. Perfect. 
Okay, so I just, um, if you just stop the future, perfect. And then I'm gonna flip over to here. All right, so this is the exact same search string from the conversation. Uh, or sorry, from the screenshot that I posted up. So you can see the question there. Um, and then I asked, can you update the search to include patients aged 18 and above and target studies done in North America? So if you're looking at your inclusion and exclusion criteria, as you're looking at a search protocol, this is a really good way to take an initial, initial search with some key terms and then give it that structure that you would need to build a search string. And you can see it goes through and it responds. And I don't actually like the response that it gave me because you can see uh, it gave adults um adult or adults or aged or older and I feel like that wasn't really something that I would do as a librarian I think that needed a little bit um and I see the question here does it account for mesh terms ah that's such a such, such a nice question because it leads right into where I'm going to show you with this conversation um so I'll get there in just a second. Uh, and so I asked it if it can improve the age section um, and that aged and older where I didn't think those were really terms that were going to help me. Um, and so just by asking it to sub out those terms with something new, this age section has now moved to adult or adulthood. It also includes young adult, middle aged, older adult, geriatric, elderly, aging or uh, aging or aging with different spellings. So you can see it really uh, went much more comprehensively. Um, I think if I were to redo this, I would also ask it to do some truncation instead <laughs> of doing each word individually. Um, but you can see how all it takes is a simple back and forth for it to restructure my search string. And as a librarian who doesn't often do systematic reviews, uh, I, I'm not the type of person who has to constantly be thinking about how to build these specific types of search strings. But occasionally I do have to work with graduate students, especially on the desk with that, uh, doing this type of work. And because I'm not familiar with it, it's really nice for me to be able to go into a tool like this and work through some of these, these uh, different areas of a search string and be able to help them uh, rather than trying to, to send them in line. Um, and then here's where I asked it to update the search term to include my mesh terms. And it actually does go in and put mesh terms. Um, and so somebody did mention, yeah, so they found that it does make up mesh terms. So this is, again, it's dealing with that predictive text where it's trying to generate content that it thinks you should know. Um, so they can be a little bit hit or miss. So I think it's the same with anything, you always want to proofread what you're getting. Uh, if you notice that something doesn't look right, or if you try it in a search and something's not working, then you can can kind of take that out. Um, we did try this one, and we noticed for the most part that the mesh terms were working fairly well, uh, but did need uh, a little bit of updating. Um, <laughs> oh, I really like someone's comment. It's like a really confident toddler. <laughs> that is, yes, that is definitely... Um, it, it thinks it knows exactly what it's talking about, but if you get into the nitty gritty, you can actually fight with it a bit too, and like tell it it's wrong and ask you to tell you, ask you to say, where did you go wrong in this? And it'll do some self-reflection, which is really interesting. Um, but so the idea here is that you can go back and forth. You can have these kind of conversations to update your searches as you go. It's not just a one and done. You asked it to do something. It gave you an output and now you're going on with your day. It is really flexible, really fluid, and, and you can kind of dictate where that conversation goes um, as you interact with it. Now, the next example, and, and I do include the screenshots of these in the slides, but uh, since we're here, I'll just pop over, um, is actually database um, uh, recommendations. So this is another one that we found that people were using tools like this for. It's kind of saying, I'm doing a systematic review on this topic. Can you recommend to me the top databases? And now for us as librarians, this might be something that uh, kind of instinctively kind of comes into our heads, but for students and researchers, it might not be the first thing that they think about. Uh, perhaps if they've read a systematic review where they only search PubMed, I've seen one where the only two things they searched were PubMed and Scopus. And so if that's all they know exists, they might not think to look at other tools. And so I start to think about how people might be using this. Or if you're at an institution uh, or an organization that doesn't have all of these resources, then you might 
kind of just like have one of those, those those memory moments where you forget about all the databases that exist. I know I can't keep all of them straight. There's there's too much content out there. So having a nice little reminder of this is the topic that I'm working on, especially if it's something that's multidisciplinary and you might have to go into the fringes a little bit to figure out what are going to be the best ways to get access to that literature. This is a, a really nice way to get a comprehensive list and then have that, again, that back and forth conversation. So this is where I'm kind of saying like, yes, we could do a Google search search to get a lot of this information, but because I can have that back and forth and I can get it to amend its results and I can tell it actually I'm looking more in this direction and there's a record of the conversation, it, it, it can be helpful in that way. Um, and someone was asking, um, uh, can ChatGPT search proprietary databases? So that's an interesting question. I don't want to say on the default, no, because we don't know what goes into the large language model that was built off. Theoretically, no. <laughs> um, there should be a paywall behind that content. But as Cindy mentioned, there are 45 terabytes worth of data. That's actually over 1 trillion individual data points, um, so textual points that are in the, the large language model that Chad GPT was trained on. And we don't know what every single one of those are. So we don't know when it was scraping the existing web to make up the training data, what fell into there and what can't. So it can't search like uh, a proprietary database the same, like, it, it, like, like again, it's not a search engine, it's not a search interface. So it's, it's not doing that, but we also don't know what went into it. So it's kind of the black box of AI um, is, is a, a conversation that that we have quite a lot. So that is, yeah, a, a nice little gray area. So it's always better to assume that it's not having access to all of that content that would traditionally be behind a paywall, that it's not having access to articles from proprietary databases, uh, because that way we keep our critical thinking skills a little bit sharper. Um, and and we uh, kind of, kind of, you know, keep using those skills. I'm just looking at some of the other comments here. Um, be interesting to see if it would capture discipline specific, like CNL or OT security. Yeah. Um, so the correct term is scrape, not search. If I understand you correctly, I, I don't necessarily think there's uh, a specific like correct term. I guess when I'm using the term scrape, um, what I'm really referring to there is the collection of all of the data points that went into the large language model. Um, so, so essentially, so if we think back to that 45 terabytes, like Sandy mentioned, that you have this huge file and, and just for brain's sake, imagine it's a flash drive and all of the text is located on that flash drive and that gets kind of uploaded into this machine learning algorithm that is then going to learn all of that data. It's not necessarily searching, it's, it's, it's searching all of that content. Uh, and so what I mean by scrape is the gathering of that into that initial file that that the large language model can learn off of. Um, so I wouldn't say that it, there's necessarily a correct or incorrect term. It, it's all just the context in which you're having the conversation. Um, and yeah, and yeah, there's another comment here, not necessarily accessing, uh, but recommending. Yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, it's not accessing any of these databases. It's just telling us that these are places that we could go to, that these are kind of your best bets based on what it knows about this information. Um, and then uh, the third example that we have here. Um, now, this one is interesting. If you are a uh, librarian that, that publishes your own research or if you're working with researchers, uh, ideation can be a really good uh, tool um, for chat GPT. So this example here, uh, I kind of walk this back to the very beginning and said, okay, I'm going to do a systematic review on skin cancer. What are the unique angles that I could use for my analysis? So maybe you have an idea for a project, but you're not quite sure where you want to take it. Or maybe, you know, because we're librarians and we don't always get the best research methodology classes in our graduate schools, maybe we want to learn what are the best research methodologies to use for our proposed ideas. This is a really good way to kind of interact with that and get feedback and ask questions. So in this case, I'm asking for approaches for a systematic review on skin cancer. It gives me eight ideas. And then I ask it to expand on topic number five for risk factors and write an abstract 
Um, and then uh, the following conversation was actually adapted from, from uh, another live preview we did where we said, could we um, basically take this abstract and then make it for a high school audience? Um, so a scientific abstract, bring it down to a high school audience. And then we asked if we could rewrite it for an eight-year-old. Um, and we really quite like this because skin cancer is a bad sickness that can happen to people who spend too much time in the sun or in tanning beds, um, which is funny because it goes to skin cancer is a serious health problem that affects many people. And then the original part was skin cancer is a significant public health issue that affects millions of people worldwide. So you can kind of see the levels of bringing down the conversation but again it's all of that back and forth that you're having with it so this this last part here was just more like a little bit of fun to see what we could do with it um but from here with the abstract you could then expand that and say okay well so let's narrow in on research methodology write me a research methodology or write me a breakdown for what i would need for my research methodology uh so that i can get ideas and then go out and do that work and that's kind of the the, the really the crux of what we're trying to do here. Um, so those are uh, the three kind of live um, things I wanted to, to be able to show you the rest of the conversation. The screenshots are in the slides. Perfect, and we'll just skip the next couple of slides because those are the screenshots. Perfect. All right. So if we don't want to play around with chat GPT, we thought we might use this time to have a bit more of a conversation. Um, so for some of you, I saw some people put ones in with the how familiar are with you AI. So um, and some people had two. So maybe this is stuff that you're already kind of considering. And, and for others who are just kind of testing the waters with these conversations, uh, we would really love to hear uh, from you uh, what concerns you have about ChatGPT in your workplace. And if you can foresee any positive uses of ChatGPT. Um, so uh, really love to open this up for conversations as well as you, if you have questions for us, we're happy to take those at this time too. And I see that there is a hand raised. Um, so it's Ebenezer, who would like to. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. I really admire the way our speakers have taken their time to break down this to some of us who don't really um, understand much about AI, chat, GPT and what have you. I want to provide a little context to my question. So I'm a PhD student of health information science and originally I'm from Ghana. I work at a university library. And then one day in our institutional email, a group of lecturers um, were really concerned about chat GPT and their main concern was about cheating. Um, then. Incidentally, one lecturer drew the attention of these lecturers with concerns that um, it would be better we look at the good side of chat GPT. There are ethical issues, especially regarding cheating. But this is something that if we are able to learn about it and encourage students to apply it in the most beneficial way, it's going to improve their essays and what have you. Um, having used chat GPT yourself to explore in the best way you can help your patrons as a librarian, um, what do you think are the ways that faculty can negotiate the delicate space of um, ethical issues among students and the best use of chat GPT to improve student performance? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really great question. Uh, Sandy, I was wondering, maybe you want to take this one since you've been doing the, the Senate. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of conversations at our university too. Um, there are task force that are looking at it in terms of academic integrity and cheating and others how about how we're going to actually use it. Um, a lot of the conversation has been around like, if students want to cheat, they'll find a way to cheat. Like, we can't really um, stop them. Um, I've read some articles that talk about how we kind of overestimate the amount of people that actually cheat. Um, so, you know, it happens. It's kind of difficult to police the use of chat GPT, right? Because it becomes a little tricky. Even some of the tools that can say if a text was written with chat GPT are also 
kind of predictive and, and use algorithms so they can also give false positives, right? Um, so I think a lot of the um, kind of focus has been on education. So educating students about chat GPT and some of their like, you know, good uses, right? Like what you might wanna use it for, like some of the things that Amanda mentioned like ideation or maybe editing or a lot of students to um, talk about it in terms of it making it a little bit more, um, making things more accessible. Like if you have a learning disability or maybe, you know, language barriers, it can help you with that. So increasing um, education on the side of the students, but also faculty, right? So they can kind of change their assignments. Like I've seen some really interesting works that faculty have done where they actually encourage the students to use ChatGPT, right? It's like, okay, write this text, write it with ChatGPT, like compare the two, did it actually help you with your assignments? Like being critical as opposed to completely banning it, um, more kind of, you know, in, engaging students with it so they can see what some of the positives and negatives are. Um, I've seen too some people um, add oral components to some assignments because then you can't use chat GPT, right? If you're having like a conversation or an oral presentation, um, it can be helpful with that. But I know we're kind of in a space where we're talking more about like education on, on all sides um, and what it can be used for and maybe not used for. But the sad reality is that, you know, before people have been able to buy papers written by other people for years, right? Like for decades, this is not actually new. Um, but we can certainly do things and engage with it in ways that kind of discourage that and people use it in a more critical fashion. Yeah. Um, we're having some excellent comments in the, the chat here. There's also another question that Sandy, I think uh, you also have probably an answer primed for this one, just based on the uh, content we were writing um, the other day. Um, is there a discussion about disclosure of using chat GPT as an author or tool used when publishing an article? Yeah, there's some journals. You may have seen some journals that have completely banned it. Um, like Nature, for example, wrote a statement saying you absolutely cannot use chat GPT in your paper. Um, others are now talking about having it be acknowledged that you used it, but it would be more as a methodology, like as a tool, because I believe there's a there's a law in the US with regard to copyright where you can't actually like you have to have a person be an author like an author cannot be an ai it has to be a person so you could not list chat gpt as a as a fellow author you would have to use it in the methodology like i use this to kind of edit my text or you know whatever whichever analysis you did uh, but there are some that are actually completely banning it as an author again because that definition of an author has to be a person um, so it's quite interesting, and I think we'll hear more about that. I know there have been discussions here about, you know, if you're a prof and it's, can you use it to author part of your syllabus or your tenure dossier? Like, there's a lot of little gray areas that need to be um, figured out as we go, I think, yeah. Uh, Sandy, there's someone put a link to, Mark uh, put a link to an article that does have ChatGPT listed as a co-author, and yeah. I think it's interesting to note that's from January 2023, so right as these conversations were being had, and this is yeah. from the journal Nurse Education in Practice, uh, so it'd be interesting to see if this is one of those ones where the, the larger publisher is eventually going to ban, like, ChatGPT as co-authors, if this is one that kind of sneaked in under the wire, and, and how that's going to go. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, lots of really useful and really amazing comments here. There's some yeah. links uh, from, I'm just looking at this one, the, the useful blog from a professor and the University of Pennsylvania, where he talks about how he's using AI in his class as well as just general AI. Yeah. It's really been amazing to see uh, a lot of uh, instructors get on board with this and then start engaging with it with their students. From the business perspective, um, when I work with startups, I have had a couple startups kind of come up to me and say, well, I can use ChatGPT to write my business plan. I can use it to write my pitch and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, as other people have mentioned in the chat here, it can be really good to start that large chunk of text initially and then do some editing, kind of help you get through that writer's block a bit and develop that kind of content. But I think where we come in as librarians and what Sandy's kind of mentioned is that educational component and our strengths really lie in 
and communicating the information literacy, the AI literacy aspect of using these tools and what that means to then augment your research with it. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the person he used it to send a message around his condo. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah, that was it. Yeah. Um, Question, would you equate chat, chat GPT to using a calculator? It's just as fast, it, oh, sorry, my thing is popping up a little bubble here. It's just as fast as an automated way to arrive at a finished product. Um, definitely, I think there can be um, kind of uh, correlations to using a calculator. I've seen other uh, other kind of useful comparisons I've seen too is like Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. and, and when that kind of emerged um, is that these are just new ways that we're augmenting existing skills uh, in our kind of information or analytical skill set um, in the same way that the, these tools have always kind of continued to come out and change the way that we search or look at information. Um, and they're always going to continue to come out. It's really just that aspect of how fast I think ChatGPT launched that has maybe kind of got us into like a little bit of a craze right now, similar to that Wikipedia craze, probably similar to the calculator craze when that first emerged. Um, but I think the important thing is that we're engaging with the topic and that we're we're keeping our eye on things and, and seeing where things are headed. Um, just thinking here, then your unique ideas for your business plan or research will become a part of chat GPT for when someone asks the right questions. Uh, our intellectual property folks are concerned. Uh, yeah, so actually intellectual property with chat GPT is really interesting um, part. So this is something that we put on our um, like chat GPT guide is ownership over content. And so chat GPT states in their terms and conditions that essentially when you input user prompts, uh, they own your prompt but you own the output of the prompt. So all those conversations that I was having with ChatGPT about the search strings and about databases, everything that I type in then goes to ChatGPT and all of the output is now content that I can claim ownership of and use. But there's a lot of ethical kind of gray area there. I'm sure Sandy as the head of the law library is gonna be dealing with a lot of <laughs> nuance surrounding that and how that would actually work in theory. Yeah, there's also a lot of concern too. I was talking with a colleague because some of the some of the checkers you can use to see if the text was written by ChatGPT actually own your input. So if you were to put in like a student assignment because you're having like doubts that this might be, you know, potentially taken from ChatGPT, it's gonna own the student content that's not yours. So it can be a little iffy. So I've heard. Um, Kind of disciplinary officers, I think I'll talk more about like looking at the citations and, and some of that and you know comparing the writing styles. Um, but there's definitely a lot of, you know, if you're using it to EDH an article that you then later publish, um, there's a lot of like gray areas in that too. Yeah. And we have another um, question here, Sandy. Uh, do you foresee that future iterations of Chat GPT or other such tools will have transparency on their data sets? So <laughs> will they open up that black box? I mean, it's a pretty big data set to go through, first of all, right? But I guess you could you could also search it. Um, but historically they haven't shared anything, right? A lot of the AI tools or even you know, other algorithms don't tend to really share what's in what's in it, which has you know implications for you know what's in it, but also bias and you know content that be may, may be marginalized and not included. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. But I know it's a you know AI researchers have made a call for more transparency, and some legislation is actually calling for more transparency. But whether they do it or not will be interesting to see. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're almost on the precipice of like change. Do we fall one way or the other? Because there is such a strong push for open everything, uh, including training data sets. Um, but then there is also that proprietary nature. There is, you know, the massive amount of data that goes into these things and it could it could fall onto either side. So I, I don't even know if I have a prediction <laughs> for which way it's going to go. Um, I see that we're like at five minutes left and I know that you also um, and actually have to do the book draw so I don't want to take up too much more time um, but if people have any other questions maybe we could take one more oh we'll be sharing the recording uh, I believe that yes that that, that the recording and, and slides will be shared so 
much. Amanda. Probably wasn't low wind. Don't count on it. Open anything. Thank you, Tim. That's. <laughs> I feel like that's where my head goes, but I don't actually want to verbalize it because then it means that there's no hope. <laughs> Maybe I'm just cynical, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert, but if anyone's seen the first episode of the most recent uh, Black Mirror series, it's a big red flag for this very topic. <laughs> I haven't watched it yet and I want to do so, but I'm also scared. So now yeah. I'm kind of intrigued. Maybe I should finally dive in and go do it. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you again, Amanda. Thank you very much um, for everything you've put together and again thank you as well to um sandy you guys are wonderful you did a great job thank you for having us oh yeah, thank, thank you so, so much um for coming and doing this presentation both of you this is this was very wonderful and just uh in closing i'd like to mention that um due to the time uh, restriction it might be best to run the draw after this session so we have recorded the participants i'd like to again mention that this session was co-sponsored by the canadian health library association by the health sciences information consortia and toronto health library associations uh, there will be two books drawn and names will be selected randomly so you will be hearing from us if your name is drawn um, in the next uh, week or so. And also the recording will be sent out to everybody who's on the registration list. If uh, you weren't on that list or know of others who may be interested, we also plan to post this on the Toronto Health Library Association website. Thank you again, uh, Sandy and uh, Amanda, both of you. I think what you did uh, was so nicely summarize where ChatGPT fits in the bigger AI umbrella. Uh, for us, and also to think about uh, use cases in the library world. Uh, for everyone who's joining from across the country, thank you so much. Um, apologies for any technical glitches 